My guest tonight is Michael Talbot, author of The Holographic Universe, a book that's taken uh, the thinking circles in the fronts of reality by storm. Um, tell us a little bit about first, Michael, about the, uh, the holographic theory, and what are some of the basics about it? Okay, well, as probably most everyone knows, <coughs> a hologram is a three-dimensional image made with the aid of laser light. And the holographic theory is an idea that was created in tandem by two men, a Stanford neurophysiologist named Carl Pribram, mm -hmm. and a University of London physicist named David Bohm, who's a former protege of Einstein. And working independently, they both came up with evidence that suggests that the universe may be a hologram, uh, more like a plastic image than a sort of sticks and stones solid thing, something that may be more changeable and perhaps even connected to the mind, as mm. opposed to separate from the mind. And uh, specifically, Pribram discovered, for example, that the brain uses the same mathematics to decipher perception as are involved in the making of a hologram, a three-dimensional image made with the aid of laser light. And this is a very strange uh, state of affairs because there are all kinds of different mathematical languages in Mother Nature. And it's, it's kind of as strange as if you found Eskimo speaking Spanish. It's mm -hmm. like, why uh, is this math particular mathematical language involved in both processes? Working independently, as I said, uh, David Bohm discovered, uh, in he's a quantum physicist, studies subatomic reality, that there are properties on the subatomic level of reality, the level where electrons, protons, and neutrons exist, that suggests that the fabric of physical reality is, resembles a hologram or is structured like a hologram. And if you put these, uh, these two notions together, that our brains seem programmed to decipher something holographic and there are suggestions that reality is uh, structured like a hologram, mm. it suggests that maybe the universe is a kind of giant hologram, and uh, not that it's made out of laser light, but that it's, it has the properties of a hologram and may be more plastic than we've realized. So we've got a model of how to understand nature, a holographic model. We've got even a model of how the brain seems to mathematically interpret interpret what we see as reality. How does this apply, or what, what are some examples of applying the holographic model to better perceiving the world? Or um, oh, there are many, and that's, that's really what got me excited in this book, is that there were so many areas, because uh, the, the holographic universe, although it was originated really to explain these, these uh, you know, the problems that each Bowman and Pribram were facing in, in their respective fields. Other people, when they heard the model, started to realize that it had applications in all kinds of different areas, from uh, parapsychology and the study of psychic phenomena to, um, to healing, to acupuncture, to near-death experiences, uh, mm -hmm. just a, an enormous range. Um, just to give an example, one of the uh, implications of the holographic universe is based on a very unusual property of a hologram that if you take a, uh, a piece of photographic film that contains an encoded holographic image that means you cannot see it with your naked eye you have to shine a laser to it to reconstruct the image and then you'll say it's an image of a rose you get a three-dimensional image of a rose if you look through the glass or through the film and see it, you can see it on the other side mm -hmm. if you cut that film in half and shine a laser through each piece you still get a whole image out of each piece. Cut it in four, you get four, eight, you get eight. Mm. And that's because uh, every small portion of a hologram contains a whole. And um, this, some people have said, well, you know, if the universe and Bohm is one of these, if the universe is a, is a kind of hologram, it means that literally every small portion of the universe contains the whole universe. Mm -hmm. You know, which is William Blake said, you know, find the universe in a grain of sand type mm -hmm. thing. And um, that means that each one of us has the entire universe of information in our heads to be able to access. So when psychics access information that there seems to be no normal sensory means for them to get it, they may be tapping into the, you know, the, the hologram of the entire universe. It's in their heads as it is in each of ours. Right. Well, I know you speak of in your book, and I've heard you talk on different occasions about your own paranormal experiences, uh, your own personal poltergeist, and how and you've really done well at, at exp using that as an example of the holographic theory. Tell us a little bit about well, that's why I got into this. I um, grew up in a, a family that was normal in most respects, very sort of mundane. My father's a blue-collar worker, my mother's a secretary. But we were always having these extraordinary experiences. Um, the pol poltergeist is a German word, means noisy ghost. And I, I used to believe that, that it began when I was five, because when I was five years old, uh, gravel started raining down out of the sky on the, the roof of our house inexplicably. My father would go out sometimes with a gun. I lived in, we lived in the country and he'd shoot the gun up because he thought someone was hiding in the trees, but we could never find gravel. And gravel, shovelfuls of gravel. He'd have to go sweep it off. And we didn't know anything about the paranormal and it wasn't until years later and a lot of other phenomena had sort of accrued 
that I discovered that was a, a sort of trait of poltergeist hauntings. Are there stories going back to the 800s of gravel raining on roofs? When, mm. uh, when uh, so it's a common practice. Amongst it's common people. practice, but this was just one of many, many experiences that, that really taught me reality is plastic. Hmm. Um, probably one one that's quite recent. I mean, within the last several years that I was very astonished by involves a little jade Buddha that I own. My mother gave it to me. It's just a small thing. It's uh, wrapped in gold. And I was going through a rough period in my life and basically was kind of in need of, of having a reassuring message from the universe that miracles are possible. <laughs> Even though, you know, part of me always believed we all have that doubting part too. And, mm -hmm. and my mother visited with my sister. She saw the Buddha on my desk and she said, oh, I remember this. And she picked it up. And I was standing next to her and as we both watched it, there was a little explosion of red light and a sphere of red light expanded away from the Buddha. Hmm. And this red stone appeared set in his forehead. And I haven't had it tested because I'm like kind of afraid to, but um, this, I, you know, I don't know if it's a ruby or not. Ruby. Yeah, but okay. my mother, uh, who's never been real, you know, she's kind of like a little bit like Mrs. Kravitz on Bewitched. She kind of ignores <laughs> these things. She sort of giggled nervously. She said, gosh, you know, I don't remember that stone being there. Mm -hmm. And I said, but mom, didn't you just see something really amazing? And she said, well, I thought I saw a little sphere of red light burst and, and explode away and then the stone appeared. And I said, well, yeah, that's what I saw. And she went, oh my gosh, is that what you saw? She, and she said, well, your sister's seen this Buddha a million times. Let's call her in here. And I said, okay, but don't tell her. Let's see if she notices the stone. My mom said, okay. And the moment my sister came in the door, my mother said, Pam, the stone just appeared. And so it was kind of blown, but Pam also did not recognize or did not remember the stone being there. She said, no, I, mm. you know, I just don't remember that stone being there. And, you know, and that's, mm. uh, you know, just another example, but it certainly challenges our, you know, the picture of reality we were taught in high school science class. Mm. And that's why I got into, you know, exploring the holographic universe, because I want to understand these things. Well, yeah. I'd, like to, I'd like to see you get that gem tested. I mean, <laughs> but, you know, but then I, I thought, what if I get it tested and it's just a fake? <laughs> I mean, what does that mean? You know, a miraculous appearance of a rhinestone. I don't want to know. <laughs> Cosmic giggle. I'd rather be ignorant of that. <laughs> so these uh, experiences have been happening to you all your life. So yeah. It seemed, yeah. It must have been a great uh, thrill for you to come across a holographic model or something that you could use to apply these experiences. Yeah, it was very exciting because I, I'm sure this is a common experience of a lot of people, but I, uh, after I learned that these things weren't normal, because at first they were just normal to mm -hmm. me, but when I started to realize that groups of my peers got very silent if I started mentioning some of the things that had occurred, I, um, I felt r rather isolated. I enjoyed, I mean, I was pleased that they were happening. I always was so fascinated. And I, you know, they were just that they were riveted my attention and I was only afraid a few times I mean some very scary things have happened to me and sometimes people go but why didn't you run mm. and and sometimes I have been afraid but I've never run because even when I'm afraid I'm like so curious I want to know what you know what is that and I'll tell you not another experience I had once um uh what looked like a luminous soap bubble attacked me and I thought it doesn't sound very frightening I know but the situation was I was playing piano in the living room of my New York apartment, and um, it was dark. I had the lights off, and my, the, I live on the ground floor in my apartment. The bench was situated so that my back was facing the window. And all, I, I'm playing away, and all of a sudden, it was like a flash bulb went off in my face. It went <coughs> right here, and I was like temporarily blinded. And, and my first impulse, I don't know why, but I thought, oh my gosh, a semi has come off. Central Park West and <laughs> driving through the um, uh, the windows of my apartment. So I literally throw myself over the piano, thinking I'm about to be killed. And then I, when I regain my footing, I look back and there's no no truck driving in the window. And for a moment, I'm just kind of uh, puzzled. And I turn back around, and behind me, hovering in the living room, is what looks like this luminous soap bubble about this big, a couple feet in diameter. Luminous soap bubble. And I got, I really panicked. I mean because I'd already gotten this adrenaline rush from thinking I'm about to die from a truck, but and I was really on my way, I was just about to run out of the room, and then my, that curiosity <laughs> took over, and I thought, no, I'll hate myself. I'll just hate myself <laughs> if I don't stay and see what this thing is. And so I said, said to it, I said, I want you to know you just scared me to death. In fact, I think I put it in a little bit cruder terms. But, um, FCC. And um, 
but I'm I'm going to stay here because I want to know why you're here and I instantly got this really negative feeling of ickiness from it but it backed off and so I knew that it it wanted me to be afraid and it did but it didn't have any power because it wasn't standing up to me and then it left it's like so. a scene from Ghostbusters I know I know but <laughs> Okay, well, you've been doing a lot of touring lately, telling people about the holographic theory and uh, going through these stories and actually doing workshops, teaching people how to apply this new yeah. model. That I'd like to get into at another, another time, unless you've got some uh, some quick uh, Oh, well, I, yeah, I have some quick. So maybe we can well, not exercises, but more examples, that I think. Because I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, although I'm interested in these things, I always do think, well, what's the point if they don't change your life in a positive way? Mm. And, and, you know, I mean, the holographic idea really says that uh, in a way that what we feed out there with our thoughts is what comes back to us, what forms the hologram. You know, so that has a slew of practical applications. Some of them aren't even paranormal. Um, the One of the things is that it, it sheds some light on and perhaps why we have so much control over our body if we're that infinitely interconnected, holographically interconnected. And that brings in the placebo effect. Uh, there's a... a study in, of a new chemotherapeutic a, therapeutic agent in um, England where they took a group of cancer patients, divided them in half, gave one half uh, placebo, a fake, and one half the real drug, but they didn't tell anyone who was receiving what. They told them all that it would, um, it was a very toxic drug, may cause them to lose their hair. And 30% of the people just taking salt water lost their hair. Hmm. And so that, I mean, think of if we're that susceptible to suggestion, mm -hmm. we can lose our, sh shoot the hair out of our head at just mm -hmm. that sentence. Think of all the things you say to yourself when you eat and drink, like, oh, God, this has this poison yeah. in it, or, you know. And what are you, you know, we have this infinite part of ourselves that is, is connected to this holographic thing. Mm -hmm. That's just one area, but every aspect of thought and attitude you have about the world, really. So your consciousness about it is probably how the Indians were able to elude lung cancer because of their relationship with tobacco, maybe. Uh, yeah, that's true. Did the Indians allude? Yeah. Well, that's amazing. The most part there. Well, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. Because I talk about in the holographic universe how here everyone's touting how aspirin ha reduces heart attacks. And in England, the studies don't show that. Mm. The British doctors are so convinced by our studies that they go, well, we'll find it sooner or later. Mm. Probably they will if they have that belief. Mm. Well, what right now is prevalent in your mind? I mean, you wrote the book uh, a little while ago. It's a very hot topic now, but what is uh, at the forefront of your... Um, well, uh, well, I'm working on one project uh, about a very talented clairvoyant named Jim Gordon uh, writing a biography of him. I'm also working on a sequel to Holographic Universe that really will talk about the practical aspects. How can we bring this... You know, that I, I love the sort of heady space-time information, but I also like to know that it has, as I said before, practical applications in my life. So that's another book. Mm -hmm. Holographic Universe, The Revenge. <laughs> no, I won't call it that. <laughs> Speaking of which, you've done a lot of uh, vampire novels. No, no, I, not a lot. I've not done lot. one vampire one. novel. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was. It's. A, I know it's. A, seems like a curious subject for me to be into, but I, I got into it because of my. I want interest in immortality. It gave me a fictional forum to sort of explore what immortality or living at least centuries would really do to consciousness. Because mm. I was always disappointed by Dracula saying he's 500 years old and acting like a 40-year-old playboy. <laughs> I thought 500 years of, of continuous human experience would really turn you into a strange creature, yeah, I think. I, you know, a different, I mean, st strange in that you would not be like a 20-year-old, a 30-year-old, or even a 70-year-old. You'd be like a 500-year-old. Mm. And so that's why I wrote the vampire novel. Yeah, you, I remember you saying that you normally write a fiction and a non-fiction and a fiction. Right, and crop rotation. Crop rotation. I'm, I'm unfortunately having to abandon my crop rotation technique the moment just because the these the two books have presented themselves with such force in my imagination mm -hmm. that I, I have to sort of write them first. What technologies that do you know of so far? I mean, there's been some work with uh, holograms and things like that. What technologies do you think best facilitate the model or are really using this new? I'd imagine it's going to well, revolutionize if you want, it. I don't know if you would consider this a technology, but I think it's the field of psychology. And that, in my mind, psychology that, that has emphasis on spirituality, you know, that recognizes that we have... Um, a spiritual aspect. I think, I think you really at, you access these things through the through the inner universe, through the mind, and the, you know the area of 
human endeavor that's exploring ways to do that is the one that's going to take us into the holographic universe.